Assalamu alaikum, everyone. We have a very special guest today. We have Dr. Hazik Muhammad. Hazik is the published author of Belief and Rule Compliance on Behavioral Economics, Blockchain, Fintech, and Islamic Finance, and Beyond Fintech. His wide research interests include financial inclusion, sustainable development, and new technology for disruptive socioeconomic advancement. Currently, he is working on business growth strategies for startups and is engaged in various consulting projects. He has a bachelor's in engineering, a master's in finance, and a PhD in Islamic finance, focusing on behavioral economics using game theory for policy and decision-making analysis. And we're very happy to have him on the show. Dr. Hadiq, thank you for coming. Thank you for having me. Okay. I'd like to start with a bit of background about yourself and just getting to know you on a personal level, sort of your life story in brief and how you got to where you are. Sure. I basically was an, was an engineer. I practiced for 10 years. I loved being an engineer. I loved solving problems. I loved meeting people, listening to their goals. And we sold them the machines that help them produce their products. And So I, just to geographically situate the events, where are we talking? Is this in Singapore or? Yes, this is okay. in Singapore. Okay. And so your bachelor's and master's and PhD, where were those done? Oh, okay. My bachelor's was done in the U.S., Okay. Uh, I was in Arkansas. I got my bachelor's in engineering in Arkansas. So I lived there from 94 to 97. And then when I switched from being an engineer to running my own consulting business, I decided to take a master's in finance. Uh, and then that one was awarded by Baruch College out of New York. But I did it from a distance. That means I did it in Singapore over the weekends and attending night classes because I was uh, having a day job. Got it. Uh, so that was from 2010 to 2012. So essentially, those two years, I didn't have a life at all. It was work and then study, work and study. And so I didn't even get to see my family that much. And then what happened was when I did the finance, I realized that there was something broken with the financial system. As you can see from the Big Shot movie, Big Shot and all that. So those kind of movies was trying to highlight the problems that we were having in our conventional financial systems. After getting that finance degree, which I thought, which I embarked on because I, want, I wanted it to help in my consultancy work. I wasn't good in finance and a lot of the businesses that I was consulting for needed help in finance and financial projections, how to raise capital and all that. But having achieved that goal of getting the master's degree, I realized that there was something that didn't sit because something that was morally off with the financial system. So I stumbled upon Islamic finance, which I which proposed itself as an ethical, more ethical system that could prove to be an alternative system for everyone, not only for Muslims. And I was really interested in into it. So I never, as a practitioner, I never foresee myself as a PhD doctorate kind of guy. But when I became very serious about wanting to learn more about Islamic finance, I was offered to, to do a PhD and I just took it with the blessing of my wife, of course. Yeah, that's helpful when you're going the PhD route, which is a tough one. So what is it about Islamic finance that you found was compelling that motivated you to dig deeper into the topic? Yeah, Islamic finance was a growing niche as it's been around. Modern Islamic finance has only been around 50, 60 years. Conventional finance has been around for 500 years. As Muslims, we were taught growing up that Islam has solutions for everything. I thought, yeah, so it, it should have solutions to the problems that we are facing from the financial system. So you, we've seen the boom and bust cycles and we've seen a financial crisis happening repeatedly throughout my lifetime, right? Your lifetime, my lifetime, we've seen it, right? 1997 Asian financial crisis to 99 2000 dot com bubble, 2008 financial crisis, which was so bad that it was compared to the Great Depression of 1935. So there must be a solution that Islam holds, right? So Islamic finance is just an extension of that study of bringing the Sharia into the financial system. And I wanted to go deeper to find out what exact solutions, exactly the question that you're asking me, what exact solutions does Islamic finance have that can repair the system? So throughout my study, what I realized is that there are some fundamental systemic issues that Islamic finance can fix. Number one, we are mainly asset-backed type of financial system. 
So being asset back and being backed up with real world assets makes the system immediately more stable, less volatile, more stable versus a system which has a lot of exotic products like der- derivatives and like CDOs and CDS. Even in a movie, The Big Shot has uh, tried to explain are basically bets on positions that people take within the financial industry. So there's no real asset backing those kind of transactions. It's basically just speculative instruments uh, that is betting on someone else's position. When you stack those bet- bets uh, up, it will eventually uh, intuitively if someone defaults, it will fall like a house of cards. Exactly in their meeting room, in their movie, they were trying to demonstrate. Yeah. So number one, a- asset back. Number two, if you ever heard about Islamic finance, they always say, that, okay, there's no riba. It's an interest-free system. So why is riba such an important thing to get rid of? So if you read the verses of the Quran from a Sharia, religious, purely spiritual and religious perspective, how much it's frowned upon? And there's a verse in Surah Baqarah, it says that Allah and His Rasul وسلم, will uh, go to war with people who deal in, in interest or uh, usury. So from an economic standpoint, we have to articulate that because if we say that Islamic finance system is for everyone, not only for Muslims, we have to articulate that because non-Muslims don't believe in the Quran. They don't believe it. Just So believe how it. would you, so the argument for derivatives and basically the unfettered creation of a risk that is basically not backed by anything and therefore not limited and the how this makes the economy very brittle. That's a, like an argument that Muslims and non-Muslims can, I think, appreciate. And we've seen the impact of the unchecked creation of risk in some of the crises that you mentioned and other instances. What about arguments for the prohibition of interest-bearing debt? How would you convince a non-Muslim that this is something without using the Quran or without using any religious text? What are the arguments that you would relay for the prohibition of interest-bearing debt? Yeah. Interest, especially compounded interest, keeps one in debt and traps the in debt in this debt cycle, in this debt trap, we call it. For the economy, it doesn't produce productive work. Essentially, you're just shifting risk to the borrower. And then if he defaults, you take away whatever collateral that he put against his borrowing. So you trap the borrower and it's very difficult. If you've been in, in debt in an interest-based, especially a compound interest-based system, how difficult it is to come out of like credit card debt and all these things. In Islam, loan is meant to be more of a health type of uh, arrangement. So in, in Arabic, we call it card. Q-A-R-D, if you want to spell it in a Roman way. And those kind of loans are meant to be seen as if you loan someone $100, what is due to you is only the $100 that you loaned up. There's no additional, no riba that's added on to that because you have not produced anything productive. So from an economic standpoint, this is the problem with riba. It does some would argue in response to that, and mm-hmm. I'm just going to play devil's advocate here. Sure. But some argue in response to that, you actually did create value by your allocating of capital to who sort of needs it or the borrower in the, in the case of a loan. And so that does create some value. And then there is some risk on the lender in the form of the default of the borrower. So there's risk there. So there's value and there's risk. And therefore, they are they are deserving of a of compensation. Again, devil's advocate, but I just want to see your answer to it, to these arguments, because they're common arguments. And then the follow up to this, actually, I'll leave the follow up uh, till after you answer. Sure. So providing capital is fine, but when you are lending someone in the form of a loan from an Islamic perspective, it's meant to help. When you are trying to help and if you're providing capital, the Sharia views it as you should be someone that's also sharing risk in the venture. And we have contracts like uh, Musharaka that, that, that does so in providing capital. Uh, but when you provide capital, uh, you also have to share the risk in order to receive a return. Because that's a new universal concept even in conventional finance. If you learn finance, they say that uh, high risk, high return, low risk, low return. When you're lending someone money and your risk returns without providing besides the capital injection you're, you're providing. But if there was... Okay, let me give you an example. Right? In a risk sharing which is a cornerstone of islamic finance arrangement when you provide capital to someone in a venture and you share the risk with them if something happens to your counterparty because you are involved in the adventure you will try your utmost because you're sharing the risk 
to ensure that he completes the venture, but in a risk transfer, which is in this compound interest where you're just lending money. If there's a problem, I want my money back. I don't really care what happens to you. That's called a risk transfer. So you can see clearly the difference between a risk sharing arrangement versus a risk transfer type of arrangement. That makes sense. So with an interest-bearing loan, there's not a full alignment of interest between the lender and the borrower because exactly. and typically there's collateral also involved with the loan. So the lender really doesn't care what the borrower ends up doing. And in fact, in some cases, we've seen this in the United States, that you've seen lenders, for example, if it's a home mortgage and the price of the house becomes more than the loan itself, the lender actually would prefer if the if the borrower defaulted because then they have a right to the asset, which is worth more than the remaining balance of the loan. So there's not an alignment of interest, but with the profit sharing model that Islamic finance espouses, there is a complete alignment of interest. So that makes full sense. Another problem with usury, which my mentor, Prof. Abbas Mirafok, who is based out of Colorado these days, he brought a very important observation, which I've not seen anyway. He also said that interest-based instruments also fall can fall into this problem of mispricing, right? If you if you understand finance, that a lot of things are, are priced based on interest rate. So the interest rate that we have in the conventional system is now also known as a pricing mechanism, where it is used to price all sorts of products. So I find it problematic when we are trying to price everything according to an interest rate, which is artificially set by banks coming together and setting a particular a number every morning. So that's how LIBOR is set. In Singapore, we have CYBOR and all of that. So as we know in the Hadith, time has taught us that we should let the market set the price, right? So this would be the real sector rate of return instead of the interest rate. Because the real sector rate of return is a real-time, accurate measure of what the market is willing to pay for a certain product or service. And that's an accurate pricing a mechanism for any market, whether it's Korean, Islamic, whatever you want to call it. I think that's, and rightly my mentor has pointed, that is the most accurate and most just way of pricing anything that's out in the market. Instead of being artificially priced by an interest rate, and when you force an artificial pricing mechanism, you cause some mispricing. And when there's mispricing, somebody's going to lose, either the buyer or the seller. And this is injustice, which Islam wants to prevent. That's a really good point, actually, that I don't think many people think about. And then when you were talking, it's, it, always, it always struck me as odd how we have a system where the Federal Reserve will meet in the United States at least. And they'll decide, what well, are we going to increase interest rates by 50 basis points, 75 basis points? And you'll have all this discussion and 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 people trying to project what the Fed's going to do. And this very sort of centralized system that really never made sense intuitively. It seemed very unnatural and not efficient. And what you're saying right now makes a lot of sense in that regard. That pricing should not be done in a closed room. It should be done by the market. That makes a lot of sense, I think. Awesome. Anything else on Riba that you'd like to add? Or I, I think that's the two main things on, on Riba that, that we can talk about right now. The last important thing is the fractional reserve system we have in our banking system, in the conventional banking system. So as you under Basel II, all banks are required to put 2% of their capital with the central bank, and then they can loan out 100%. So that's how credit is created in the fractional reserve banking system. And that 8% reserve is called the capital adequacy ratio or CAR in the financial world. After the 2008 financial crisis, they realized that this is a problem and they wanted to increase the reserve that's kept in the central bank. So they increase it to 12.5% under Basel III. So this is still inadequate because what this means is that banks put only one-eighth of what they generally loan out with the central bank and 7 8 is created out of thin air. So that is credit creation in a fractional reserve banking system. So in a fully Islamic system, which is still not practiced by Islamic banks all around the world because they follow this fractional reserve system, it should be a full reserve system because it makes sense to only deal, do business with what you have. If you have $100 million as a bank, you should be, only be able to loan out $100 million to your customers. It shouldn't be times eight. That's leveraging eight times and it will make any organization 
more fragile than it should ever be. So if you, if under a full reserve system and we had great thinkers outside of the Muslim world, the University of Chicago back in the 30s, they came out with this and they said that the banking system needs to be a full reserve system. And this idea was known as the Chicago plan, right? And in 2012, a group of IMF economists tested, used some simulation software and they tested out this theory. And what they found out was that if this was carried out, GDP growth would be at 10%, which is much more than the GDP growth that we're seeing in most developed countries, especially in the US. So there is economic wisdom in not having a final reserve system and going with a full reserve system. Of course, that would mean the volume of money out there will be much smaller than what it is currently today. But we should be going towards GDP growth because when you when a nation becomes wealthy, so does its citizen. And when its citizens are able to earn an income and unemployment is reduced, we would be able to solve a lot of the social issues that we are seeing currently out. That's very interesting. And by the way, for those who are unfamiliar, GDP refers to gross domestic product and refers to the amount of products and services that an economy produces. And basically what has utility that the economy produces, and that's really the two source of wealth for any for any people. What is it in that study? Because this is really intriguing. Did they narrow down what the reason or explain the reason why a full reserve banking system would actually cause an increase in GDP from the what we've experienced to 10%? I think GDP on average has been closer to 5% than 10%. So what is the reason why GDP growth would increase under a full reserve system? I can't remember exactly what were the exact points that they had in the paper. I can look it up and I can send the paper to you. The, but the important points would be when you have limited credit growth, the capital that you have would definitely go into the real sector of the economy. The current system that we have is that the financial sector of the economy has grown to be larger than mm. the real sector of the economy. And the real sector of the economy are the uh, industries like logistics, uh, manufacturing, healthcare, pharmaceuticals, oil and gas, uh, real estate, and all that. So those are the industries that really drive growth, right? Because they create jobs, they create by creating jobs, they create income for people. And from the income of people, they pay and buy other goods and that's income for small businesses and all that. So that's the money that keeps the world going. But if you're only when you have created so much credit and people are using that capital and taking bets in CDOs and CDS and keeping the money within the financial sector, it doesn't it prevents real capital going into the real sector of the economy that really creates the jobs and employment that we need to drive real growth. In the financial sector, it's, it seems you are, when you are taking positions and if you're a smart guy and you're making money within the financial sector, you're just making money for yourself and your company. It doesn't really create more jobs and drive the economy as it should, according to logic as well as according to the Sharia. That because makes this a lot what, of sense. Right. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. I actually remember in college, some of our brightest, my, my brightest classmates ended up pursuing careers that essentially when you boil it down yeah they financially they made a lot of money but when you boil it down they didn't really produce any good or service they just basically made bets on different things as you're mentioning and made their money that way uh, which doesn't really make anyone richer so i often ask myself if the, all of those iq points were put into something that was productive and what did, could they come up with so that's that this is very uh, this is very enlightening what do you think then if we do go to a full reserve banking system let's say in theory how would money be created in that system and then maybe this could be a good segue into another part of this conversation which i'd like to go into with you which is cryptocurrency blockchain and their applications so first let's start with how is money created in an islamic economy right so in a pure islamic and full reserve system in order to be able to do more business you would have to attract more capital so that means you would have attract and you would have to attract shareholders with more capital so that you can expand for instance right now you're a 100 million dollar bank if you wanted to do 150 or 200 million you would have to attract capital that way so either you attract shareholders or you attract a more 
uh, depositors to your system. So that would be how to create money in a full uh, reserve banking system. But the, but the money itself is coming from depositors. So there's a certain amount of money in the economy. How does that money get created? How does that money get created? It gets created when people with capital, they go into ventures with... But where did people. they get that capital from? I'm talking about like the... So in the United States, clearly money is created from credit, right? It's created from loans. Right. We're on an island, 100 Muslims. <laughs> they want to set up an Islamic e- economy. How does the currency in this economy get created to start with? Okay, currency, the way we are using it today is it's a means of exchange. So whether we use a digital asset or we use paper or we use a cow hide or horse hide or whatever, those currencies are just a means of representation of for you to buy something else. So it's a means of exchange. I'm not sure what you're asking exactly about how money is created, but this is the definition of a currency. In in the old days, we, we use gold coins, right? So gold coins also had another the function where it was also a store of value because not only were the coins used to arrange for goods that you really need like vegetable food meat whatever the coin itself was made of gold so it has a store of value because if you didn't want to exchange it you could sell the gold let me ask my question yeah. in a different way then, okay. try and see if i can communicate what i'm trying to communicate typically currency has been printed issued by the state and if you're going back to your example of gold there was a policy surrounding how many coins were issued by the state. And perhaps it was just whatever gold we can find, that's what we're going to use. And basically, the implicit policy there is we introduce gold into the economy based on how much gold we have. That's right. But now with digital currencies and paper currencies, the amount of currency you can issue into an economy is unlimited. And in, in the West, they try to they try to control that amount with interest rates because money is created through debt, through credit. Since there's no like hard limit on how much digital currency one can create, how would an Islamic economy actually create money? Or would it just be hard assets? That's what's acceptable as money. And therefore, like paper money, digital money, soft money, as it is often referred to, is, is in, your, in your mind, not part of an Islamic economy. Okay. In the full reserve system, if you had 100 million, you could issue 100 million worth of money. So that's how money is created. You have 100, you can issue only 100. But in a fractional reserve system, you have 100, you could actually issue 800. Okay. But where does that 100 come from? It comes from your wealth, from your resources, from what you already own, right? It's like gold, right? The gold, it's in the ground. You have to mine it and you have to so you you issued the number of gold coins you could issue is the amount of gold that you have. So same for full reserve bank, right? If you want to issue hundred million worth of money, you should have a hundred million worth of resources within your. Okay, so basically your position is that money has to be tied to some sort That's of right. resource, for example, gold or silver or something like that. And then basically, it's created based on how much of that stuff is that you have in existence. Right. Okay. That's right. yeah. Let's move on to blockchain and cryptocurrencies. First off, if you don't mind giving the viewer just a, as, as a practical as possible as this is, giving the viewer a primer on blockchain, what it is and what it means. Basically. Okay, so blockchain is the underlying technology for Bitcoin. This very smart person under the pseudonym of Satoshi Nakamoto created it because he was frustrated after the 2008 financial crisis. He wrote a white paper at the end of 2009 because the people who were supposed to be watching the system did not do what they were supposed to do. So they did not carry out their fiduciary duties. So he was very frustrated and then he said, okay, then why do we need to transact through a middleman, like a bank or or someone that that issues an ATM card or a credit card or or whatever? Why can't I transact peer-to-peer, right? If I want to buy something from you, Rakan, why should I have to pay through my bank, which will exchange payment through your bank? You receive the payment and then you transfer the item that I want from you. Why why can't we do peer-to-peer? So he decided to create this coin called the Bitcoin, which was meant to facilitate this peer-to-peer exchange. So he solved a lot of problems like the double spending problem because it's a digital asset and all that. So you can read the white paper on how he solved it and and all that. So it's a little bit complex if you don't understand computer science. And even he says that I can't explain it simpler. You just have to get to this level to, to understand how it works. 
Okay, so essentially what the underlying technology to Bitcoin, which is the blockchain works, is that it identifies the owner of this particular asset through information that's stored in a block. So let's say if I were to buy a pair of Nike shoes from Rakan, uh, and if these shoes were tied to a blockchain, the last block on this chain of blocks, which has information of the previous owners, the newest block, the last block would have Rakan as the owner. So now that I want to buy it from Rakan, a new block would be created and it would have my details on that latest block and it gets attached to the rest of the chain of blocks. So the la- the la- most recent block would have my name. The block before that would have Rakan's name. So we would have a traceability of the entire ownership and the prices that's paid, whatever, for these Nike issues. So in order for that new block to get attached to this chain of blocks, there would be nodes out in the cloud that will verify that this transaction is legitimate, right? So the number of nodes uh, has been predetermined by the programmer who created this blockchain in, in, from block uh, zero, from the in, uh, from the initial block. So he determined how many nodes there are to verify uh, this transaction. So it could be four, it could be 10, it could be 100, it could be 1,000. But of course, the more blocks you have, it will slow down the transaction. So once all the nodes agree that this block, this transaction is legitimate, it will verify that this block is good. I am the new owner of these Nike shoes. They will create this block, verify it, and attach this latest block to this chain of blocks. So essentially, that's how a blockchain sort of like works. Got it. So it's essentially a digital record of transactions that's verified by a decentralized network of computers. That's right. Got it. Got it. And what are your thoughts on blockchain and cryptocurrencies? And how do you think they fit in with Islamic finance and Islamic economy? (laughs) A very big question, I know. Yeah, it's a very controversial area. I I actually was excited about the blockchain when I first read about it in, in 2016 and where at that time blockchain was starting to become a buzzword and all that. It was a system that to me, I saw it as a trust mechanism because you had these nodes and network of computers that's verifying a particular transaction. It's a beautiful way to generate trust, especially between two counterparties that have not done business before. So it was a fantastic puzzle in my mind to solve this trust problem in in, in new businesses or in new transactions between counterparties that they have not transacted before. And then we went into this whole slew of cryptocurrency and, and now NFTs and all that, right? We distracted away from the beauty of what I first saw a blockchain could solve. Because if we could categorize blockchain utility and, and, and use cryptocurrency would be a small portion of what a blockchain can be applied to the economy, right? Because you have the first category, which is cryptocurrency and tokens. Second category would be a ledger system, which could be a database of title deeds for mortgages or land or company registration of, of ownership for luxury goods, the Mona Lisa, those kind of very unique type of assets, right? A database or a ledger system. A third one would be a payment system where you could tokenize any currency and then use the tokens through the blockchain to transfer very quickly across jurisdiction. So when you tokenize a financial payment system, it could potentially move faster than the SWIFT system that we have currently. But Visa and MasterCard is the one that's very speedy and very quick these days. And the digital space is like the blockchain space is struggling to to match that speed. But if they can solve certain problems, it could supersede Visa and MasterCard. So a payment system. And the the last one would be smart contracts. And this would be especially useful for Islamic finance because we are a contract agreement based type of system. And when you have any... If you can digitize those kind of agreements and the different type of contracts that we have into a smart contract, it would make Islamic finance more efficient and all that. So there's four broad categories for blockchain applications and cryptocurrency is just one small one. But because of the rise of blockchain, but not these days right, when it's decreasing in value, it always comes back when Bitcoin rises in value, right? Dogecoin or Ethereum or whatsoever. And when it increases in value, this discussion comes back and this whole discussion on cryptocurrency, although it's a small category, it like blocks out all other conversations because it seems to catch the headlines uh, every single day. People waiting for Bitcoin to make a comeback and especially when you're holding Bitcoin and you want that to happen. And then you have the people on the other side who wants Bitcoin and 
all these other cryptocurrency to basically fail and die because it's not it's volatile it's not tied to a real world asset those uh, currencies which say they are pegged to the US dollar did not do it properly because they don't understand monetary economics and then they have crash and burn and all that so there's a lot of confusion in this uh, in this area because they are just so many varieties of them and they are created by private entities which do not have the capacity to guarantee them. Unlike currency that's issued by a country, any currency that's issued by a country, whether it's Singapore dollar or the US dollar, it's guaranteed by that country. Right? Whether it's a fiat currency or a digital currency, whatever form it is, if it is issued by a country, it will be guaranteed by a country and they will ensure that if you hold that currency, you can use it anywhere in the world because it's guaranteed by them. But if you're if it's a privately issued digital currency, it is ha- unlikely that they can guarantee it. They will speak volumes. They will try to create this atmosphere that it can be done. But unless they have enough wealth in the world to back up every token that they issue, every cryptocurrency that they issue, I would not take their word for it. So therefore, I conclude from what you're saying that cryptos like Bitcoin or Dogecoin or Ethereum, or I would exclude Ethereum, but cryptos that purport to simply act as a commodity, a means of exchange, a store of value, these are cryptos that you don't see the merit of, basically. Yeah, we need to be a little bit careful when we are using them because we need to understand why we're using it and the expectations or the assumptions that we have actually goes with what they are promising you when they're issuing that currency to you. This is something which I advise a lot of people when they realize that I have some knowledge on this area and they get into these schemes where people are just creating currency and having these funky names that they do go on uh, along with it. Uh, and it's essentially almost like a Ponzi scheme or some kind of scheme that needs to be looked at very carefully because when they issue a certain token or cryptocurrency for anything, we have to understand that it has to be backed by whatever value that they're trying to sell to you. What is the pricing mechanism that they're using to price their token or their cryptocurrency? It has to be, as we mentioned before, it has to be set by the market. And the market pricing mechanism is What is the price that someone is willing to pay for whatever product, goods and services, and then you price it? It shouldn't be set by the people who created it. But isn't that how cryptocurrency works now? It's set by the market. Yeah, so they have created crypto exchanges and then they float it in the exchanges and then people trade and whatsoever to get a certain price. But the problem with that is the market is very tiny as to legitimate stock exchange with legitimate commodities, legitimate companies that has been that has matured and has gone through the process of IPO and, and all of that. The cryptocurrencies that are being issued were issued through ICOs and through now STOs. So I I am not sure how it is really because the market that is setting the price for it is a very small market. And when you have a very small market it's made up of basically a group of enthusiasts right? yeah. who want to see the value go up. So they are willing to pay a higher price than what it's, it can be if the market were to open to a much larger pool of, of people that would make up a legitimate market. So we use the term markets, but it, it's, a, it's almost like an artificial market and a full-fledged type of market. So yeah. we have to be very careful when we, when we assess their credibility and all that. Yeah, agreed. I, there's definitely some. So if I were to rephrase this argument, volume is important. Like volume of transaction, not just like market cap or the price of a token, but the volume of transactions will tell you how legitimate the price actually is, how legitimate the market cap is. So on that spectrum, there's there's a wide spectrum of volumes for cryptocurrencies. There's more than 10,000 cryptocurrencies, and some of them have very high volume. I think with regards to Bitcoin, Ethereum, top 10 currencies, they have very high value in terms of transactions. 
others have a very low value. And obviously the extreme example would be NFTs, which often have ridiculously small volume levels. And I think now with the introduction of different technologies that added liquidity to the NFT market, you saw the price of NFTs drop in many cases. What cryptocurrencies, if any, are you actually a fan of? Because I know from what you said that there's a whole host of them that you're not a fan of. Are there any that you actually like and you actually see merit in? Personally, I have to say this as a disclaimer. I do not invest in any cryptocurrency. I'm a huge fan of the blockchain, but not into cryptocurrency. But if I were to answer your question, Ethereum is a company which I like a lot. I think they are trying to solve a lot of problems. They started as a smart contract platform. Vitalik Buterin was a huge fan of the Bitcoin, but he saw certain limitations with the Bitcoin which he wanted to solve. So hence he created uh, Ethereum and he has done a lot of good things with Ethereum. So if I were to invest in Ethereum, I would invest it as a company. I would not necessarily buy cryptocurrency because I want to invest in, in ideas and in applications that can create a better economy. If it's a tokenized economy, there's there's nothing wrong having a tokenized economy. If you can tokenize an, an entire economy using Ethereum tokens, I think that's fine. As long as it's backed by real world assets. Because a tokenization allows you to move or to trade illiquid assets. So this one unlocks a lot of value for the economy. And this is where I see the use for to for tokens, not in 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 those as you mentioned, right? Those coins that are just uh, in the background trying to capitalize on on a get rich as quick scheme or something like that. Yeah, yeah. So if we are going to use cryptocurrency or blockchain, it has to provide certain kind of value to the economy, right? Yeah, it has to solve uh, problems which. The current system, like the fiat currency system or the Islamic system as it is today, is unable to do. Right? Then I would sit up and I would be willing to listen to you and even participate if I can in, in, in such an endeavor. Uh, because we are here to create value for mankind, but we need to do so in a safe manner and in a sustainable manner. Right. It shouldn't be like a fad or hit and run because it doesn't help anyone and, and it leaves a very bad taste in people's mouths when they lose their entire savings and, and all that. And we don't want to be part of that. And that is not what is being Islam, being a Muslim or being Islamic is about. Yeah, I wholeheartedly agree. There should be an emphasis on utility when you're approaching the cryptocurrency space. Yeah. Now you mentioned that like Ethereum as a company, you would, so it seemed like you were implying it was like a centralized organization as opposed to a decentralized organization, which is the advertisement that they like to put out there. So I wanted to ask you about your thoughts on, and I agree with you, Ethereum is very centralized and people who buy into the decentralized of Ethereum probably haven't looked into it as much as they need to. But in terms of just that question of decentralization, how do you view decentralization and do you view it as a positive or a negative? And I'll give you two examples from Islam, one for centralization, one for decentralization. On the centralization side, you have Rasul said, is a kuntum salasa fa'amiru ahadakum. So if you're three people, one of you should be chosen as basically the emir. So, so there's direction there in that group. And then the other side of it is that if you look at, for example, Quran, the Hadith, the basically our deen, our religion, really has been preserved in a decentralized fashion. So there wasn't like one central authority that preserved the religion. Like, for example, Catholics have the institution of the Pope. We don't have that in Islam. So what are your thoughts on centralization and decentralization, some of the pros and cons of decentralization? When is it appropriate to use and when isn't it? Okay. Okay. So before I, I get to, to the answer to, to your very good and very pointed questions, I would like to say that in the current setup of a full publicly, a fully decentralized system, we don't have that on the blockchain yet, not anywhere in the world. If they claim they are fully decentralized, I just have to say that's not true. So even yeah. Bitcoin, you would say, is not decentralized. That is decentralized, but in a system using a block like a like a decentralized application, it's not fully decentralized. It's autonomous, semi-autonomous, like a private type of blockchain, right? So it has some some decentralization, but it's not fully decentralized. 
Why is that so? Is because we are still in the early stages of blockchain implementation. In order to have a fully decentralized system, we should we need to have blockchainized systems from around the globe already set up and already fully running with no problems. And then you connect them. So you have private type of blockchains coming together to become semi-public. And then once it's all connected, then you will have a fully decentralized public blockchain which is the ultimate vision that, that we're seeing in as a blockchain application. In order for that to happen, we need to have all stakeholders in the blockchain system to govern themselves. That means to have a self-governing system that looks after the interests of everyone that's involved. And I don't see that happening because human beings are prone to cheat, to take advantage of people, to do this, to do that. So if we want to pursue this utopia of having a fully decentralized system, we have to first enforce self-governance, which I don't see it happening because of how humanity is just is. Right? Whether you're Muslim or non-Muslim, we prone to getting angry and getting back at people and taking advantage and all that. It's part of our DNA. I don't see that happening. That's why we have a governance system, like a rule of law, set of statutes and laws in, in every country. We even have the Sharia to encourage us to do what's good and to forbid what's evil. So that's essentially a set of laws and statutes of every country, which we see repeatedly over and over in the Al-Quran Bunka. Enjoin good and forbid evil. Essentially, that's a governance system for all of us. I think we can take advantage of decentralization. I see the merits of it. It is efficient. It's cost efficient. It reduces the resources that's dedicated versus a fully centralized system. In terms of cybersecurity, if you have a partially decentralized system, it deters the hackers from attacking, just focusing on one centralized system. A one centralized system helps the hacker because they just focus on one area, a central depository of database of private information or a centralized deposit of coins or money or value or whatever, right? Commodities or whatsoever. A decentralized system would make it more difficult when you have 10, 10 places where you, you store your items of value versus one centralized area. So there's merit in that. But from a governance standpoint, of all stakeholders that's involved, whether you are the programmer or you are a customer of this blockchain system, there has to be a strong governance system that watches over the, the weaknesses of human behavior, which is criminal behavior and all of that. Right. So this is where I forget the there are some intellectuals that's mentioned before, and I quote this guy in my thesis. He says that a selfish species like the human being needs to have a governance system that watches over them. So we have the Sharia that types behaviors that we want we need to carry out in order to optimize our life on earth and the actions that are proscribed, that, that we are told that we are discouraged from. Right? like harming people, cheating and being unkind and, and, and all that. So we have the Sharia that watches over us. Right? We, are, we are autonomous as human beings. We can do whatever we want. That is the beauty of being a human being. We have a choice, right? But our choices are limited by the Sharia. What is permissible and what is not. I think the idea behind decentralization is not that there isn't any governance, but that the governance is enforced by the sort of incentive system that that is in place and or group supervision and the group su supervision is basically motivated by maintained by that incentive system so is this something that you think is possible or do you think no there has to be like a central authority and this central authority is what people answer to and that's basically how you preserve order and how you enforce ethical behavior. doesn't have to necessarily be a central system, but it has to be a system where everybody agrees that these are the governing values that should govern this system, whether it's an, through an incentive system or it's through incentive and punishment system. or it, it could be, and I don't want to limit anybody's creativity because there could be some uh, genius that's listening to this podcast and he's thinking of a, of and a system. By the way, of, all uh, my audience are geniuses. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> so we... Like you know, and subscribe, by the way. And subscribe <laughs> after that. Constantly. Absolutely, yeah. Always subscribe. <laughs> yeah, it, it could be any system that anybody can think about. It, it, 
doesn't have to be a central system as long as collectively we agree that this is the kind of governance that we need to see and to protect everyone within the system that watches over everyone's interests. Not only the individual interests, but also the collective interests. This is what Adam Smith meant when he says that the invisible hand looks after the collective. In the pursuit of individual interests, self-interest, the invisible hand will take care of the collective interests. What he meant, because he was a moral philosopher before he was an economist, so what he meant was that this ethics and moral foundation which he laid down in his book Before the Wealth of Nations, which is the theory of moral sentiments, was to lay down the moral requirements before you can engage into the economy. So he wrote that book before he wrote The Wealth of Nations, which is basically on economics. So likewise, for the Shah, we have to understand what are the rules within the principle of permissibility in Islam, what the Sharia wants you to do and what it's trying to tell you not to do before we think about creating applications or engaging in the economy and all that so that we can manifest that kind of values in our everyday actions, right? How we treat our neighbors, how we treat our suppliers, our buyers, our customers, our family, our bosses, our staff, and everybody else within the entire economy and in our daily lives. Got it. So what are you working on these days? I'm working on several things. I'm always keeping busy working on several things because I have many interests. Sometimes it's a challenge to focus on the things that I need to do because it's I'm a little bit impatient, which is not necessarily a good trait. And I want things to be done like yesterday. But I've go- with age, I've grown to realize that you can only focus on certain things. So I tend to schedule things to be done. I've written books that I want to write and there are stuff that I think there needs to also be uh, written. There are startups uh, which I want to build, which have yet to be built, which I think needs to be built, especially things like improvements in the transparency and distribution of the zakat system, which is essentially a mechanism that can solve poverty. Sometimes as Muslims, we take for granted the social, the powerful social institutions that we have, uh, like the zakat and the wakaf system. The zakat system is an obligatory system. It's not a voluntary system. It's an obligatory. So you have to pay zakat. And studies have been shown by bodies in, in Indonesia and in, in elsewhere. Even political scientists who are non-Muslims have observed this in Muslims, majority Muslim nations. They say that the, the zakat system, which is 2.5% tax on unused wealth, if redistributed to the eight beneficiaries, right, the eight asnaf that's defined in the Al-Quran, it would solve a lot of problems, including poverty. So there's a, a zakat agency of Indonesia that has done a study and he says that not even 2.5%. He says that if zakat collection was 100% in Indonesia, not 2.5%, right? I think below 2% would solve poverty for Indonesia, where currently 50% of their population, which is a population of 250 million people, are living below the poverty line. So just the zakat system, if people who were supposed to pay zakat paid zakat and it was collected efficiently, that means no leakages, no nothing. You collect it, X amount, and X amount is directly distributed to the eight beneficiaries, you would solve poverty. And perhaps there is a room for a blockchain to make the process more efficient. Exactly. And because of the traceability of the blockchain, it helps people to track. Let's say I'm a zakat donor. I want to know exactly if, if I paid $2,000 in zakat last year, I want to know exactly every cent on that $2,000, how much of it went to these eight groups of people. So if we yeah. could have a transparent dashboard based on the blockchain that says that, okay, 20% went to Gharimin, 30% went to Fisa Bilillah and all that. Then for sure next year, I'll be so happy of this transparency, I'll contribute more. And it's not only me, it, it would be every zakat donor. And the benefit to that in a transparent system like that would be the zakat collection would continue to improve year on year and we'll be able to solve more and more gift to those people who are in need of that zakat money that they they deserve to have. Yeah, I think that's a great idea. To be honest, I get a lot of emails from people who are trying to promote like some sort of cryptocurrency that is marketed towards Muslims or blockchain project that's marketed towards Muslims. And I have to say all of them have had very little practical utility. And it's really sad because there's so many implementations for blockchain that could actually be useful that people aren't really working on, Muslims aren't really working on. And 
It's just some missed opportunities. So far, it's just been, for lack of better word, it's just a money grab, an attempted money grab. But if you actually focus on solving a real world problem, you'll not only solve the real world problem, but also there's probably a lot of profit opportunity there. But you have to first start with the problem and not start with the idea of, oh, this is going to make me money. And I think a lot of entrepreneurs in the finance space forget about that like the refugee crisis the refugee crisis essentially majority of the refugees are muslims it's yeah. coming out from muslim countries right yeah even the un right the unhcr they are tapping into cut money to help the refugees we don't have to wait for the un to provide that kind of direction right? yeah we have a, we know we understand we are contributing to a zakat system in every nation that we're living in whether you're a majority muslim country or you're a minority muslim country each Muslim community has a zakat system. So if we could set up an international zakat platform where each of us can contribute not only domestically but internationally, we can directly help refugees. We talk about the Ummah and helping other Muslims and all that. Right? This is a real-world problem which we can work on immediately. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. So if any of the geniuses who are watching this podcast would like to reach out to Dr. Hazi and and work with him on this project, uh, then please do. And I'm happy to promote it as well. As it comes to fruition, inshallah. Any books that you're coming out with soon that perhaps people should know about? Thank you for allowing me to plug. I had the opportunity with a co-author of mine who I found in one of the talks that I, you know, attend many conferences in the past. And this particular co-author of mine was one of the speakers that I spoke with at a conference in Islam in Pakistan. And we we got to talking and we, we realized that we had material, each of us, that we can come together and create a book. So we actually wrote the first book on Islamic fintech back in 2018. It's called Blockchain, Fintech and Islamic Finance. And yesterday, sorry, not yesterday, today was the official publication of its second edition. Oh, wow. So that's a very good timing. Excellent timing. Excellent timing. <laughs> and the book was well received. The public publisher was very pleased with the first edition and they wanted to update the materials because anything with technology changes very quickly and they wanted us to update the materials, the stats that we had in, in the first edition. And then also we had the opportunity to add three new chapters to the second edition. So these three new chapters I thought was very important. Number one was to deal with the aging risk of the use of new technologies like AI and blockchain and IoT. Because sometimes we forget, we talk about the beauty of new technology, what can solve decentralization traceability, efficiency, real-time tracking, and all that. But we forget that when we use new technology, you're also introducing new risk to the system. So for AI, which uses big data, so big data is the fuel for AI algorithms. Just petrol or gas is the fuel to our cars and our vehicles. We need to understand that big data risk, the sources of big data would be new risk that we are introducing to any system that's using AI algorithms. If we are using blockchain smart contracts, the governance protocols of blockchains are new risk that we are introducing to blockchain AI systems. If we are using smart contracts, smart contract risks a new risk that we're introducing to, to the systems. So for any CTOs or any blockchain computer science programmers out there listening to this podcast, they fully understand what we're talking about there in this chapter. It's just for, for other entrepreneurs who are looking into implementing these new technologies. Just bear in mind that there are new risks that your team needs to be aware of. So that's one new chapter. Second chapter is using the blockchain to build a cash wakaf system. Wakaf essentially is a also a, a powerful social institution that we have. And the condition that makes it different from other social institutions like Infadaka and Zakat that we have is that it has a perpetuity component. So like an endowment. It has to survive generations and it has to basically be in perpetuity. So if you have a blockchain line system, it would help in doing so. And a cash wakaf system is a concept where it's meant to solve charity fatigue. This constant giving, we have a lot of Muslim relief, Islamic relief, constantly asking to help everyone that's in need. And it's only natural for us to get tired of giving. It's yeah. part of our human nature. We feel bad and all that, but 
we have to understand that it's part of human nature. So in order to solve this charity fatigue, if we can have a cash wakaf type of system where you donate maybe $100 one time, and if you have a 1,000 people donating $100 each, that's $100,000. So this system would have $100,000 and they would ma- they would have a team to manage this $100,000, which needs to remain untouched. What they use is the profit from the investment of this capital that is meant to remain in perpetuity. So that means you donate $100 one time and this fantastic management of this cash workup system will create a lot of money which they would use, but the initial capital would always remain intact. So that solves the charity fatigue problem because you only donate one time and every year the returns would just roll over and they would use that access to the causes which they want to help. This assumes, of course, that no money is ever lost. Exactly. So if we could create pearl systems like that all around the world using this cash wakaf concept, it would help a lot of people out there. Agreed. Agreed. And what was the third? The third one is something which a lot of people has talked about in the past, but it never got implemented because of many reasons. It's creating a unified Islamic uh, currency. So in this chapter, I propose two ways to doing so, to create a unified Islamic currency called the digital dinner based on the blockchain. So one way we could create it is to base it on a basket of commodities, not only on gold, because you have a, a large community that's calling for returning to be backed by gold, to have a currency like the gold dinar and all that. But we see a lot of problems because of the full reserve system that we also need to satisfy. So why stick to one commodity when you can have a basket of commodities? You can mix it with hard commodities and as well as soft commodities, but it has to be based on a system that can allow this to happen. And we discussed that in that chapter. And then the second concept was to have, if you don't want to go to a commodities-based asset type of currency, you can take the average of the top biggest nations from the OIC and have an average of that, something like the EU is doing. So they already have a value in their currency. You take the 10 biggest GDP from the OIC countries or 10 top 10 or top 20, it's up to you. But in the chapter, I took only the top 10 and then they can come together, uh, take an average, create a unified currency, which they can call the digital dinar, whatever name they, they, they want to call it. I just use the digital dinar as a name. And then we need to have Islamic Central Bank to oversee the operations and the liquidity functions and the policies that will govern the monetary policy of this unified country. Very interesting. Yeah, I hope the, this discussion actually gets people's juices flowing with regards to the many different problems that can potentially be solved and the applications that can be created using chain technology. And there's a lot of legitimate legitimate applications out there. We just need to focus on problem solving as opposed to anything else. I think the ideas for Zakat and Waqaf are fantastic ideas as implementation uh, implementation for a blockchain technology. A lot of people actually argue that Bitcoin is an Islamic form of, of money and currency. Perhaps that's the topic of a future discussion, inshallah. But uh, I do want to thank you, Dr. for this discussion. And I hope that we can do this again, inshallah. Inshallah. Thank you for reaching out to me and giving me this opportunity to speak on your podcast. It's been a huge honor. My pleasure. I, Where can people find you, by the way? You can just Google me. If you want to connect me, you can connect me on LinkedIn. Okay, I'll leave the link to your LinkedIn profile in the description of this video. And where can people get your book? You can find it on Amazon or any good uh, online bookstores. It's already being sold as of this morning. Perfect. So we'll leave a link to that as well in the description. Awesome. All right. And thank you all for listening. And until next time, Assalamu Alaikum and peace be upon you all.